Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Kern. I'm the president of Cirrus 10, and uh, this is Eric Redman. He's our chief architect. He's going to do most of the talking today. This picture actually kind of shows what I do for a living. I, I, uh, I talk on the phone and go out to eat, and uh, I like it like that. What I don't know a lot about is bridging color vocabularies with color space similarity, and that's where Eric comes into the picture. One thing you should know about me is that I love horror movies, and um, I have two small kids and uh, a wife who keeps me from watching horror movies uh, because I have two small kids. Um, but this is the best, has, has anybody seen The Witch? Yeah? The Witch is the best horror movie I've seen like since I started watching uh, movies again. I just saw it earlier this year. Um, this is the most evil game of peekaboo ever. And it, you can't really see it because of the contrast here, but that's the hero of the story, Black Philip, the uh, goat. He, uh, he is the, the center of the story. He gets the girl at the end, everything. He's, he's the best. So I, uh, I saw The Witch. I was really stoked on that movie. And uh, I wanted to find something else to stay in the vein of horror. So I went, as one does, to Rotten Tomatoes. And I went to the genre filter and said, I want to see all of the horror movies that you've got available ranked by um, the freshness score here. And the first one, and you can see The Witch is here at 90%. But up here at 91% is Bone Tomahawk. So I thought, oh, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I'll watch Bone Tomahawk. It's, it's better than The Witch. So I, I, I have to check that out. So I have two ways to watch movies on my phone. One is Amazon Prime, and I go and search there, and Bone Tomahawk comes up as the first result, and that's great. The problem is, that's not what I did. The first thing that I did was I opened up Netflix, and I searched for Bone Tomahawk, and you can see what I got. And you can see that, uh, like Bone Tomahawk, which stars Kurt Russell, that Netflix gives me The Hateful Eight, which has Kurt Russell, as well as a bunch of other movies that are kind of gory westerns. And what I like about this search experience on Netflix is that they don't have the title that I want. They don't have Bone Tomahawk like Amazon does. But they know what Bone Tomahawk is. They know that it's a western. They know that it's gory. And, uh, and so they're giving me results that are relevant to my goal my goal is not Bone Tomahawk right now. My goal is to watch a scary movie, and I want it to be in some kind of a vein. And so they recognize that my intent uh, was to watch that kind of a movie, and these are the kind of results that they give me. And so I think this is what we want to work on over the next several years in our company, is trying to get beyond textual matching when it comes to presenting results back in a search experience, and getting back to the intent, the user's goal. And so that's really what uh, today's session is about. Eric is going to talk about doing that with colors. And he's going to go into the history of identifying colors and color theory and lots of other interesting things. So Eric. There you are. Thanks, Peter. So uh, I work on making the things Peter just talked about happen. That's my goal. How can we take search relevance beyond how well the query terms match terms in a product database? So not just an algorithmic approach to search relevance, but really figuring out what is the task, what's the goal that the user is trying to accomplish. So this image here I'm showing you, this is a picture of what's called the C-Lab color space. I'm, I'm going to refer to this throughout quite a bit. And Colors, I used to think of as kind of a second class part of the relevance problem. So I would color, you know, put it off to the side. That's easy. We just need to make sure the color terms that the retailer or whoever has assigned are indexed and we'll be fine. Well, it's not, it's not that easy. And one of the issues is that we have multiple vocabularies. So people searching for, let's say, I'm looking for a garment, and I'm searching for uh, periwinkle, periwinkle tops for women. It's very likely that the retailer doesn't use that word periwinkle. They might use 
loving my life or, you know, some marketing term for the color that doesn't even have a real color word in it. So how can we bridge them? We can use a color space like this, and that's, that's what I'm going to talk through. There are a lot of sections to this, so I'm going to try to move through quickly. And, but, you know, keep me honest, if I breeze through something too quickly and you have a question, feel free, ask, but we will need to keep moving through. All right, relevance perspectives. When I started working on search, really it was in the 90s working on RDBMS type searches, you know, your Oracle database included a search feature and so on. And then moved on into Indeca. And I had this stakeholder who was a VP of sales at this academic bookseller, uh, which is where I was working. And he said, here's one of your test cases. If the query is war and peace and that's it, then it's obvious they're searching for Tolstoy's war and peace. And I accepted that. I didn't, I didn't challenge him. And we were wrong. It seems obvious, doesn't it? I mean, we're looking at this. But the thing is, the company I wor worked for, Blackwell's Book Services, our goal was to help academic libraries review the 1,000 to 1,200 new scholarly monographs that are published every week and make sure they were building their collection the way they meant to. And, and the idea of an academic library backfilling classics like War and Peace, they do that. But it's, it's a once in a while thing. So we were actually wrong. And guess what the, the former job of my stakeholder was? He was a professor of English. So a lot of bias there. So uh, what's, what's the knowledge focus of that Blackwell's database? And what's the goal or the usual goal of the people using that? We weren't really cluing into that. And this, this takes me to four views or perspectives of thinking about search relevance. And these are talked about, if you go read the literature on information retrieval and relevance, you'll encounter these four concepts and others, but primarily these four, and that's old, right? We're going back to the 70s for most of these. And the first one I have here is that algorithmic or system view, this I, the idea that we can construct algorithms that are so precise and clever in how they match query terms to a knowledge base that will get the most relevant objects first. And the user view is that the user knows best. So we need to hear, we need feedback and signals from the user. They're the best at telling us what is relevant. There are some issues with that. They aren't always the best. They may be a novice in the field, the, the knowledge base that they're searching in. Subject literature approach is, it sounds academic and it does have maybe its beginnings there, but this is about impact, right? An article, a journal article has impact if it's cited in a whole variety of monographs or other journal articles. But you could also think of Google PageRank as a type of uh, uh, this type of view of search relevance. And finally, subject knowledge or the epistemological uh, view of relevance. This is another old one, but it kind of, I don't know why, it sort of fell from favor, maybe because it's really hard to do. I'm not going to say that this is the best view of search relevance. I'm going to say that we have to consider all four of these. We can't throw any of them, can't ignore any of them. Here's an example. So if I'm searching at Chico's, uh, I hope you're familiar with that, women's clothing mainly, and I search for maraschino cherry, then thinking about what's the knowledge perspective of Chico's, you know, chic clothing for, I don't want to be rude, women older than a certain age. And uh, the person searching is using one of their color terms. So we know something about the perspective of both the user and the, and the system that's being searched there. Or if we search Thrillist, we're gonna get these cocktail ideas and so on, right? So it, 
it's really important to consider how the two knowledge frameworks match up, the user or the searcher in the system. And that leads to this, I don't know if I call it a famous quote, but it, it's a rule, right, that says something's relevant to a task if it helps accomplish the goal implied by the task. So that's, that's the view we're trying to take at Cirrus 10 that Peter described. And one aspect of this problem of trying to link up the two knowledge perspectives is vocabularies. We see this a lot. One of the things we'll do at Cirrus 10 is help people with uh, managing their search service. So if you like, we can help take care of the configuration and updating of your search service in its current incarnation as you're working on future stuff. And so we see all the time uh, the vocabulary difference. And how do we typically take care of that, right? It's synonym entries or, or if you're using Indeca, the, the thesaurus and so on. But the problem here is kind of boiling down to the customer doesn't necessarily know the correct vocabulary. And we need a way to bridge these vocabularies. It's not this endless chasing of synonym terms. It's just a ineffective and, and not scalable way to handle this problem. So we're going to talk about color vocabularies here specifically. Remember when I started, I said that I didn't really give color the weight I should have looking at the problem. I know I missed that because of how much work we do with color when we help people manage your search service. And so here we are. There was a, a study done called the World Color Survey way back in the 70s. And the idea here was that colors evolve in about the same way in language universally. So not just in English, not just in Romance languages, but all kinds of languages, even unwritten languages. And these people, Berlin and Kay, uh, postulated this and then did the World Color Survey to back it up. And what they found is that, in fact, there are these basic color terms that they aren't in all languages, but they evolve in the same way as the need arises. So color terms come to use in a language as they're needed, as people using that language need to talk about things of those colors. So I'm, I'm kind of laying out where do the common color terms that we use come from. Then we have these marketing vocabularies. I, mean, I, I made one up, I can't remember what I said, but life is good or something like that. And why do they do this? Because the color name in a, in a product database is one of the tools to sell products. They aren't trying to give an accurate, like a, a pink color. Well, those are a whole other story, but they're not, they're not trying to be accurate. They're trying to evoke an emotion or something. And so, again, we're looking for a way to bridge these common customer vocabularies with these marketing customer vocabularies. And one of the ways we've been doing this type of work, bridging vocabularies at Cirrus 10, is with an ontology. So we implement an ontology as a directed graph, and we can connect product type vocabularies and style vocabularies and so on that way. But when we get into colors, there are so many and so many types of relationship, like this color is just the same as that one, or this is nearly the same. And you'll see later why that matters. It, it's unwieldy. There are too many entries, and we just can't keep up with it. So our goal is find another way that when someone searches for a periwinkle top, 
that we can show them something that the retailer called Amparo Blue. How do we get that done without constantly making these synonym entries? We okay? Yeah. All right. And the way I'm suggesting that we can do this is with a color space or a perceptually uniform color space. So map the colors into that color space, the marketing color names and the common color names, and then we can find how close they are. And, and this idea of a color space is based on work that started in, in the 19th century to think about how do humans perceive color? So going back qu quite a long time and before people could actually measure things like how cells responded to light, they used a lot of clever experiments and so on to come up with this idea that it seems like the human eye has three types of cells for sensing light and that they, those three types of cells differ by the wavelengths of light that they pick up. I won't read through all of this, but the idea was that it seems like there's a red cone cell in the eye, a blue cone cell in the eye, and a green cone cell in the eye. They were close. Those aren't actually the, the colors that our cone cells pick up, but, but close enough. And so moving on through the 19th century, uh, there was this Hermann Gunther Grossmann was one of those polymath people, and he, he established the early concepts or primary concepts of linear algebra at the same time as working on the idea of a color space and experimenting with this trichromatic theory. So it was a, a perfect combination of skills for someone to pull this all together. And so he was, do, we don't know if he was the first, but one of the first documented to say that, oh, it looks like we could represent the way we see color in a three-dimensional space. And then a little while later, another person came up with what seemed like a competing theory. Now we sense colors by an op opponent process. So there are colors that can't mix. And what I mean by that is you can't have a yellowish blue. And maybe you'll say, well, sure you can. That's green. Well, no, that's green. You don't call it yellowish blue. You have bluish red and yellowish green. But the others, this argument went, are, are like unmixable opposites. So not much later, people realized, wait, they aren't conflicting theories. They actually work together. So the current theory about the physiology of how we interpret color is the trichromatic theory is correct in, in the first sensation we get in the eye. And then the interpretation of that is more based on this opponent color theory. And so color spaces, the way they're laid out, right? You think of a color space or a color wheel, who says red should be next to orange? Well, the color spaces are organized along the two theories of opponent color process and the trichromatic theory, or I'm saying trichromatic, tristimulus theory. So here is one of the early, you know, early 20th century color space ideas. And the CIE took the tri-stimulus tri values that had been measured from experimentation with people and came up with XYZ coordinates, XYZ for the three uh, wavelengths they were looking at, and developed this color space. The issue with it, though, is that and just taking the wavelengths that we pick up for various colors, if you move in one part of this color space, let's just say a unit distance, you know, 
whatever one is, I'm going to move a distance of one. That difference may be imperceptible. That looks like the same color to most humans. But if I go to another part of the color space, say the blue part, all of a sudden a distance of one is very noticeable, like it's quite different. So it, it's not perceptually uniform. So the goal was how do we get from this to a perceptually uniform space so that we can use that to do work like this soil sample looks good because it matches this printed card that says that's the color of a good soil sample and, and make the stuff work all through the color space. By the way, sorry, this is a little sidetrack. When we talk about uh, what color something is, you know that if you shine a blue light on something, the color you perceive is very different from if you shine a white light or a slightly yellowish white light. And so in all of this work to develop these color spaces, the CIE and others were very careful to state what is the color of white that we're using. So if you look into this, you'll see this is with a D65 white point. That's just a definition of some combination of powers of different wavelengths to make that white light. And this example of D65, they were trying to get a European daylight light. This is the first attempt at a perceptually uniform color space. And I don't know if you've heard of the Munsell uh, color system, but developed by Professor Munsell, uh, right at the same time that the CIE was working on their first XYZ color space. And Munsell's system is based on, was well, based on physical cards. Like you would have this card and it would have a lifespan because things fade, right? And these cards would be used for checking things like soil samples and, um, you know, important industrial type work. It wasn't about matching house paint or something like that. And then on the heels of that, the CIE wanted to do a more uh, out measurement based approach. So they developed a transformation of that XYZ color space that we talked about a minute ago. They transformed it to make it perceptually uniform. At least that was their attempt. And this is just an image of within, within the color space shown here, we can fill the whole thing, but we can't see it. So this is the part that humans can see within the color space they came up with. But it actually works for outside of our vision colors or energies of photons. It's called well, I'm going to say it the short way, C-Lab. So you'll, you'll hear people talk about C-Lab if you get into color spaces. And the asterisks are not something about scientific notation or math. It's, there was already another group, Hunter, doing work on this, and they called theirs lab, so they start them. In some cases, they wanted to do cylindrical calculations, so they published a transformation to uh, cylindrical coordinates. So we've got this idea of a color space and it's hopefully perceptually uniform. And now we can calculate distances between points in the color space. So we're getting closer to our goal I talked about, but it didn't work. They, they found out when they put it into practice that there were still areas, the blue area of the color space was problematic. It's not, not perceptually uniform with the rest of the color space. That's why I have the, the um, Hubble before after images up here, because rather than rewrite the transformation to the color space to make a, a different color space, it was already in so much use that they said, well, we'll 
we'll come up with a different algorithm to calculate distance. So instead of what we would normally use in linear algebra, Euclidean distance calculation, we'll add some weights and corrections depending on where we are in the color space. And that's, this is a list showing an evolution of that effort. So the first one was called delta E. E is, I forget what language, a word that, that means like perception or experience. So in 76, it was just Euclidean distance. Then in 1994, after experiments, they said, okay, we've, we've got some improvements based on working with this so far. So that's CIE 94. And then in 2000, added some more corrections. This uh, CIE Delta E 2000 has a lot of calculations in it. And I'm not saying that it can't be done, but I didn't start there because I wanted something whereby I could at query time in less than 10 milliseconds, find all of the colors within a certain distance of the search color. And uh, you can, I will accept, I'm guilty of premature optimization here, but I, I stayed away from CIE 2000 and instead used the CMCLC, which is kind of old, but the idea with that one is it works pretty well if we just describe an ellipsis, uh, sorry, ellipsoid, um, to talk about the tolerance from some color point to all of the colors that are close enough. It's uh, calculating an ellipsoid is very simple compared to CIE 2000. All right, so we've talked about there is a a set of color vocabularies. We're trying to bridge those through a color space that's perceptually uniform or can be corrected to that. But who maps the colors into these color spaces? Who's the authority on it? You, you give me a name, where does it go in the color space? I like this image. It's not, it's based on a kind of a fun uh, color name survey that was done by a comedian. And some of the color names we can't say here, but it's, just, it's hilarious. So you should check it out. This is his map. He just, he just opened up the th three saturated sides of an RGB, sorry, saturated sides of an RGB cube. Sometimes people will say, oh, I wish he didn't write over the, no, he's not writing over it. You're just seeing the three squares making up the three sides. And based on his survey, this is what people named these colors after he filtered out what my mom looks like in the morning or something. And you can see that uh, the green area is huge. And that's why all of this work to find a perceptually uniform color space. And you can also see that Look how, how small the areas are, the boundaries around some of these names when they get more specific. So we're in the section now about, okay, who's the authority? And they do come from surveys, just not from comedians. And, and one of the earliest and most successful ones was this ISCC uh, thesaurus. And this is a group that's composed of representatives from industry groups and government agencies and so on. And they worked on this for years. You can see defined the thesaurus, how it would work, and, and didn't complete it until 1955. But it, it was very successful in its goal of helping people who are trying to, you know, make sure pool of water is clean and soil is okay and your beer is coming along fine. That's, that's what those color names are for. And when they describe them, they, they would describe what is the focal point color, like this is the most precise definition of that color. And then everything within this much, so they describe the boundary within the thesaurus, really useful survey. 
And then I've already mentioned the 1970 World Color Survey. Um, this is more useful to show that there is a lot of universality to the focal points of color. So even if it's in a different language or even an unwritten language, red is red. And prior to Berlin and Kay doing their study, that actually wasn't believed. It was thought that it would vary quite a bit from language to language. Pantone, many of you will have heard of Pantone. They're owned by X right now. And they claim the title of, of the authority, right? The global authority on color. I shouldn't say it in that tone. They, they work really hard at it. And their color um, specifications are specific to applications. And that's super useful. So like if you dye cotton and you call it lavender, here's what we say it is. HP did a study. So they work a lot with, of course, uh, they're trying to produce printed images with ink and so on and making them consistent. And also let customers know when they're straying, like, oh, your background is way too close to your foreground and so on. And they ran a study for years, uh, a crowdsourcing, one of the early crowdsourcing efforts to get what are the coordinates of these colors. Again, the, what's the focal point? What's the boundary around the color? They did that through a, a website crowdsourcing thing. I've already covered this. All right, marketing color names. Well, the retailers, the authority. So that one up front seems easy, right? Well, they can just tell us. But we know that's actually not the case because a lot of retailers are selling garments and products made by other manufacturers and bringing them together. So there's a name that comes along with the color. How do you figure out what that really is? Well, you could maybe get it from the manufacturer, but we can also scan. We can scan cotton material and metallic shiny materials, and there are scanners purpose made for each application. Like if you want to scan fabric or you want to scan auto paint or something. So the retailer, we, we'd have to work with them to get the data for their marketing term colors. So now I'm, I'm making the argument that we're, we're seeing there's a way to do this, right? We've got a color space that's perceptually uniform or close to that. And we've got some candidate authorities for common color names that we can work with. And we've got a way to get uh, the, the specifications of colors from the retailers for marketing colors. So let's, let's see if it works. So I, I did an experiment in Postgres and why did I choose that? Why not solar? I, I knew about a tool in Postgres that's very fast at calculating distances in n dimensions. So I just started there because I didn't want to wrestle with that in, uh, in solar up front. So again, back to the, that CMC distance I talked about just a little more about these ellipsoids that we're looking at here. When we calculate a CMC, they call it a tolerance. You give, you give a, their idea was, you give the equation what your commercial factor is. A commercial factor being, you know, I'm, I'm dying fabric and it's acceptable in this application that the color is within this ellipsoid. The commercial factor is describing the, essentially the volume, the size of the ellipsoid. And then you have some other things you can specify. L and C, that's where the name comes from. L for lightness and then C for chroma, how saturated is it? And once you specify those, you get a certain ellipsoid. So I, I use this cube extension in Postgres that I mentioned. And uh, it, I love this extension. Check it out. You get a Euclidean distance operator without coding a thing. And you get support for what's called gist indexes and 
Postgres, so super fast search. And I loaded up a database in Postgres of hundreds of terms from uh, retailer and uh, this goofy website. You should, it's fun too, you can check that out. Just lots of color names. And here we go. Can I find colors that are matching periwinkle? And I, I wrote this uh, procedure and exercise it. And sure enough, we find that we can find marketing color terms using a common color term. So an example, let's say that someone searches for deep periwinkle and people actually do search that way. Uh, and the retailer has a color that's called Amparo Blue and is sort of close. Is that close enough? I'm going to say yes. I would want to show that in search results. And so I found these colors using that little experimental Postgres database that I wrote using this uh, CMC distance thing with a 2 to 1 L to C ratio within a, a tolerance of 5. So I, I would argue this is an example of just include that in the results. You don't have to say, sorry, we couldn't, don't have any periwinkle tops. But what if the query is for navy blue trousers, yeah, trousers, and we don't have anything close enough. You know, these are pretty different. But this is uh, Pantone's definition for navy blue. But it'd be a much better zero results suggestion, I think, to be able to say something along the line, sorry, we don't have any navy blue trousers, but you might enjoy these. I just used a different commercial factor or distance of eight instead of five as with the last example. So where do we go from here? I've got like one minute left. Um, we need to settle on a trusted authority for the common color vocabulary. And so we can't, you know, we can't just start using Pantone values. They care, they care a lot about that. So there's a licensing question if Pantone is the answer. Uh, and then who's the trusted authority for marketing color terms? Um, I think start with someone who's got their own their colors under their control, so they can just give us coordinates. And then adjust these boundaries depending on the type of color. So if I, if I search for dark blue, I think that's intuitively a much larger space, tolerant space, right, than if I search for periwinkle. And we also know, or studies have shown that Color spaces are, in a sense, warped when you get close to a boundary. So when you get to the boundary between blue and purple, if you go one direction a certain distance, you're still blue. But if you go the other direction toward purple, that same distance, you're, you're way into purple land. You've left the blue world. And so you can't, when I say the boundary warps, it means that things get really tight when you get close to a boundary, but loose when you move towards the centroid of a, of a color. So we need to figure out how to address that. And we need to use feedback from analytics and other signals to know how we need to adjust these things. So it's not just a person looking at the results and saying, okay, I think we nailed it. It's gonna evolve color ideas about what is periwinkle evolve over time. And that's what we're working on. Any questions? Yes. Uh, is this uh, used to solve the colors which you don't have? Or, or is this work with the other solution? Mm-hmm. Uh, do you combine this approach with that or how 
right. practical use case yeah. for this versus the other. Because you can solve almost, uh, you know, depending on you know what type of query you are carrying, but eighty uh, percent gets solved based on entity extraction and uh, understanding that you got the color in the query and you have one. <sighs> This is about when the vocabularies just don't match. So periwinkle is not going to be extracted from in a, in a text way from the product database. So the search comes in with a common term like periwinkle. We don't have any of those. It's solving that problem without chasing the synonym entries all of the time because the, the search for color, there's just a lot of variety and how people search for color. Have you seen the mix, what hits in existing versus uh, outside? Um, I understand periwinkle, but it's there. Uh, do you have any? Uh, we have some that match and some that don't. Yeah, uh, what's the percentage you have seen? Is, uh, I think we need help. to add, maybe we can have the. Yeah, I'm so sorry, guys. We have to wrap it up to hand over the room, but I don't okay. know, Eric, do you want to leave? If people have questions, a way to get a hold of you? There is a way you can get a hold of me, eric.redman at cirrus10.com. Awesome. And that, do Thank it. you so much, gentlemen. Thank you, guys. <laughs>